Hello guys, this is Panzermeister36, and in today's video we're going to be looking at how to paint in German tropical camouflage. And these tropical camouflage patterns are not super well understood by most modelers out there, but they were very common in the early mid-war period, not only in North Africa, but also on the Eastern Front. For that reason, I thought it would be interesting for you guys if I made a tutorial on how to paint and weather this historical finish. Of course, we're going to do a little bit more than just the airbrushing of the camouflage. We're also going to look at some extra things like the detailed painting and weathering of the model. So we'll do some chipping effects, apply the enamel washes to make shadows, and also look at painting the stowage as an extra treat for you guys today. As always, I hope you guys enjoy the video, and now let's get started. For a little bit of historical background, the tropical camouflage, or tropentarn, that we're going to be painting today is the first scheme which was introduced in March of 1941. A second lighter scheme as you can see in the front here was introduced in 1942 but we're not going to look at that today. This was a camouflage that was used in tropical regions which is mainly North Africa but also extensively on the Eastern Front and we have countless color photos to prove that. As I'm showing you here these are all original color not colorized. And the way you understand this is that you can see all these vehicles like for example this Stoke 3 here or these Panzer III's, which are built in 1942, and that is before the introduction of the standard German dark yellow Dunkelgelb in February 1943. In summary, these tropical camouflage patterns were used during the period in which most other equipment was painted in Panzer Grey, and compared to the later war German Dunkelgelb, the first pattern of tropical camouflage we're looking at today is a more orangey brown, darker color and it generally has this low contrast green gray stripe pattern covering about 30% of the vehicle. Now, how are we going to paint this camouflage on our vehicle? Well, as an example, AK Real Color has these two paints in the historical line. However, I think that they are way too close together and when you use these, you don't end up with any contrast between the two colors. So in the past, when I did this pattern, I used the RAL 8000 base color and to represent the RAL 7008, I used a 50-50 mix of these two paints here, which was much better in my opinion. I'll link that older video in the upper right hand corner here. Also I've got original batch AK Real Colors, so they've all dried up anyways, so we can't use them. Instead we're going to look at Tamiya Colors, which are more universal and I think would be a better way to show the tropical camouflage painting. So I'm going to use XF59 for the base, Rally 8000, and XF49 for the camouflage color. And yes, Tamiya does now make a color to represent RAL 8000, but I don't think it's quite right. To my eye, it's much too brown and greenish almost. I think XF59 is much better on the left here. Alright, so let's actually look at our model and get started with some real painting. The vehicle is base painted with LP18 to represent the red primer, and the black rubber areas are painted with LP27. For my Tamiya painting on the top of this for the actual camouflage, I thin all my paints with lacquer thinner to make them spray much more smoothly. And here I'm loading up my XF59 for the base color, again, RAL 8000. As always, I've thinned my Tamiya paint with at least 60% thinner, and that gives me a nice thin mix which I can build up in multiple thin coats. As you can see here, I'm applying it to the front, and then I work on it at the top a little bit, apply a thin coat there while the front dries, and then I go back and apply another coat to the front. And this is generally what I do. I'll, I'll apply a, a moderate coat to one panel, then move on to the next panel, and then kind of work back over multiple times so that, you know, each of my thin layers has a little bit of time to dry before the next one. And the end result is that I end up with a very smooth and nice finish, uh, sometimes even a little bit of a satin finish with the Tamiya paints. The wheels had already been painted with that dark grey, so now I use the wheel mask to spray the hubs with the same base color. And here's our base color of XF59 applied to the model, and I think this looks perfect for the historical color we're going after, which is that RAL 8000 base color. But next up we gotta paint the second color, which is that low contrast camouflage. And for that we'll use XF49. I did some initial experimentation on the lower hull sides and my discovery was that XF49 needs a little bit of lightening because the contrast was too high. So I mixed some of that with a little bit of the XF59 base color 
to just bring that green closer to the base and reduce the contrast. Now Tamiya paints sometimes can vary slightly between each bottle so perhaps whatever colors you have on hand might be a little different and therefore your mix might need to be slightly different but my ratio should be a nice starting point. As the on-screen text pointed out, my mixture is now even thinner at at least 70% thinner to 30% paint. And that's so that I can get an even lower pressure, get an even finer with the airbrush, and paint those nice precise camouflage squiggles. At the end, I stopped and gave the model a full once over to notice any spots that needed touch ups. Never be afraid to go back and fine tune your camouflage so you're happy with it. And I also repainted a few areas that would be masked under the closed viewport so the camouflage shouldn't extend in those areas. And with that, we've completed the application of the camouflage, and I think this looks excellent. I think these two colors from Tamiya pair nicely together to make this tropical camouflage scheme. And I think my contrast might be a little bit higher than it really should be, but it will be toned down with subsequent weathering, so no worries right now. Next up, we're going to look at applying the decals. And these ones on the turret side need to interact with these open viewports, so we have to actually slice up the decals to apply them properly. I begin by soaking the decals in warm water for anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds and I simply apply them to the model on top of the paint. I do not apply a gloss varnish beforehand. I adjust the position then I roll the decal with a brush to remove any water or air trapped underneath it. And lastly we apply microsol on top to soften the decal so it really sinks and almost melts into that base paint. And the same process is repeated with the rest of the decals, applied, adjusted, rolled, and then soaked with the setting solution so that they really give that painted on look. The fact that I don't use a gloss varnish before my decals is quite controversial to some people, and if you want to do so, you may go ahead and apply a gloss varnish before your decals. It's perfectly fine if you want to but personally I find that I do not need to do so, so it simply saves me time not having to apply it and let it dry. I just put the decals right on the paint and I have good experience with that. The Tamiya paints applied in thin coats give a relatively smooth finish, and the decals applied with Microsol, they just seem to work for me. Next up, we're gonna start with the weathering of our tropical camouflage pattern. Let's start the weathering process by applying some chipping effects to the model. For this, we're gonna do some brush applied two-tone chipping effects. I will use AK third gen acrylic buff and saddle brown, as well as VMS slow-mo retarder to make the acrylic paints dry more slowly. I've also got a very fine long brush here to carefully apply some specific chipping effects. However, we're actually gonna start with a foam sponge. This is called sponge chipping and it can greatly speed up the application of most of the chips to the model. I simply have a piece of foam packing sponge from some packing material from long ago. And I've put a little bit of the acrylic buff paint in there, almost like dry brushing, just a very small amount of paint in the sponge. And I'm simply tapping it to the model, letting the raised edges and so on catch the sponge and the texture of the sponge transfers the paint in a chipping pattern. This also has a very natural effect because in real life these raised edges would catch wear and tear and in this case they also catch the paint from the sponge. Very quickly that gave us most of our chipping effects though in some areas I'm going to take my fine brush I showed you earlier and go in and create some even more careful applications especially on the flat areas. The foam sponge works well on edges but not as well on flat panels so in these areas I can make little chips and scrapes and scratches with my fine brush using the lighter buff color here to simulate some superficial damage to the paint. In some heavier areas, I will then take the red primer color, saddle brown, and apply some depth to some of those lighter chips to simulate damage through that superficial scratch 
showing the underlying red primer of the real vehicle. Note that much of the chipping is kept around hatches and the areas of the vehicle right next to hatches where the crew would walk to access the hatches. I'm not applying chipping everywhere because that's going to be excessive. And there we go. We've achieved some very nice chipping effects with that two-tone look, which I think looks excellent. And it was not painstaking because that sponge chipping saved us a bunch of time. This is the kind of chipping and the level of chipping that I aim for with my models recently, emphasizing the crew access points while not going completely overboard because chipping can get out of hand very quick and look unrealistic. Now let's continue the acrylic painting stages and begin with detail painting. Just before that though, I'm going to pop the clear parts into the model finally. I didn't put them in during assembly and this way I didn't have to mask them when I painted the model. I just leave them separate and I pop them in now. Now for the actual mounting for these vision blocks and viewports in real life, I found some historical photos that show that the entire assembly is black. So I painted the arms, the frame, and the actual outer housing of the view block itself with AK rubber black. This way I get the nice clear see-through aspect of this view block, but then the entire assembly around it is painted black. And it looks excellent. Similarly, around the turret front viewport, I found a historical photo that showed that the face that's masked when the plate is lowered appears to be the ivory interior color. Next up, I painted the tools with a base color for wooden areas with Panzerace's 310 Old Wood, and then I used AK third generation acrylic basalt gray for metal areas. Then I go back and paint some wood grain with vampiric flesh over the wood areas, and this way I can make a nice wood texture. And similarly, I can create some texture and scraping with a lightened gray mixture of the AK paints on the metal areas as well. It's very quick and easy and it has a nice effect. Of course, when we apply some washes, that'll further accentuate the textures and details here, but for now, this is good enough. Another detail to paint was the ball mount inside the Kugelblend machine gun. And this, because it's like a bearing surface essentially, it appears to be some kind of bare metal or coated metal area. So I painted it with a black base first and then I took this AK reddish gray and stippled and dry brushed to create something that matched the photograph. For the cover for the main gun barrel, similarly, I painted that first with a base of the same rubber black. And then I worked dry brushing style with a few lighter and lighter browns. I think I started first with model color German camouflage black brown. Dry brush that a little bit. And I took the AK third generation leather brown, dry brush that as well. And with a few progressive lightenings of that, I got some decent looking highlights and shadows on the very nicely molded resin piece there. The stowed helmets were painted first with a base custom mixed field gray and then on some of them I applied a color to simulate field applied camouflage. So I used Panzerace's old wood here and chipped it with a wet brush just when the paint was still kind of fresh. On another helmet I painted it with a custom mix to simulate the apple green color. The German helmets were painted in numerous different colors so this allowed me to add some interest to the vehicle. The smoke grenades in the launchers were painted with a field gray color. In the same style as chipping that we did on the hull, I made some two-tone chipping on the wooden ammo boxes with a lighter version of the base color, in this case lighter green, and then instead of red primer, we now use a wooden color. And another repeat technique here is using sponge chipping on the edges of these jerry cans, much like we did on the areas of the hull. We start with sponge chipping and then we can use our fine brush for a little bit of detail work. Now my good YouTube modeling buddy Adam Mann bullied me into painting uh, Zeltbahn camouflage on one of my tarps because he sent me that nice historical photograph. So I picked the smallest one and I did my best at painting the Zeltbahn pattern. I am not 
excellent at painting tarps and I'm also not good at painting camouflage or figures. So this was a new experience for me, but I think I did a half decent job. Just basically picking a few colors here from my selection on hand and trying to match that cool Zelt Bond pattern. Uh, I gotta get better at figure painting, but this came out all right, so I'm pretty pleased with that. With everything painted, I put on anything that was left separate, so that's like this rack at the back with the wooden planks to hold the water jerry cans, spare wheel, and so on. This was all based off reference photos of this unit in North Africa, and a little bit of stowage was a long way to livening up a vehicle. Now let's wrap up the painting and weathering of our tropical camouflage pattern with an enamel wash. But before you apply the wash, it's key to apply a varnish beforehand. So in this case, I've already airbrushed on a coat of VMS satin varnish with my Badger Chrome. After the varnish, I will then go in with my brown enamel wash. I also have enamel thinner for any cleanup of excess. And I have a very fine paintbrush here, which I'm gonna use for the application and cleaning up of the wash. It's a five over zero. I've already applied the wash onto this fender here to warm up, and I want you to note how much all the details pop out there. And now compare that to the hull front where it's difficult to make out all the weld lines and bolts and all the details. With the wash, we can fix that because a dark brown wash like this will add essentially darker contrast around all the details and make them pop out. The wash simulates both a fake shadow, which makes the model look a little bit larger than life, and also contributes to the general dirtiness and filthiness of the model. In this case, I'm using the wash straight from the bottle, though some washes need to be thinned down. And I'm simply taking it with a fine brush and applying little bits of it here and there around all the details I want to pop out. The satin varnish I airbrushed beforehand makes the wash flow nicely and stick around all the details. In some areas like here and a few other points, you could end up with a little bit of excess where the wash has flowed away from the detail and onto the flat panel. That's very easy to fix. I simply take a little bit of enamel thinner on my brush, just a little bit, and I can go in there and essentially wipe away that excess material. This is why we usually use oil paints or enamel based washes for a wash like this, because they take a long time to dry and it's very easy to go back and reactivate them and do this touch-up work. If instead you used an acrylic paint for the wash, it can be much harder to clean that up. Compared to just a minute ago, now see how much more these details pop out. All the panel lines and welds and bolts on the hull front here are much more noticeable and it makes the model look larger than life. Let's continue with the wash on the turret. Same process, simply apply a little bit of the wash here and there with a brush. And then if there's excess in places you don't like, simply wipe it away with a little bit of thinner. And here's the result of the wash in the model. I always say that the wash is the most powerful weathering technique in my opinion because it does so much to contribute towards the overall weathered look. It makes the details pop out, it makes the model look like it's got some grime and dirt in recessed areas, and it also helps to tone down the chipping which can sometimes be overpowering. That's why I did the chipping beforehand and the wash now. We've now completed the painting and weathering of our German first pattern tropical camouflage. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and learned something new. Like I said at the beginning, these tropical camouflage patterns are not super well understood by most modelers, but there's plenty of photographic evidence and also plenty of surviving documentation about their use not only in North Africa, but also on the Eastern Front. In the future, I will do a video on the second pattern of tropical camouflage as well, and also look out for another video on this Panzer III in which we will look at how to apply dust effects for North Africa. As always, if you have any questions or comments, Post them on below. I always read through them all and reply as best as I can. And if you like my work, you can support me for just $1 a month on Patreon. That money really goes a long way towards me buying the paints and products to make these videos for you guys. As always, I'll see you guys next time. Until then, stay safe and happy modeling.